We've heard uh, Shankar Sharma, uh, the SEBI WTM, uh, Anant Narayan, and they've all talked about markets and they are high, but you know the last last day has been a bit of a jitter. But in general, markets are high, and people here we had a, a raise of hands on how many have mutual funds. A lot of people here invest in mutual funds, uh, which is great. And data actually shows that because the number of DMAT accounts has been consistently going up post-COVID, and even the mutual fund equity inflow has been consistently rising. So, uh, but the other problem that a lot of investors kind of get into or face is, uh, uh, you know, this uh, need or greed, let's say, to uh, make quick bucks. And that's where the risk kind of comes in. So, uh, welcome Mr. Surana. Mr. Surana is here. Uh, so, uh, just continuing on that, uh, SEBI, in fact, had a recent study which showed that uh, almost 93% of individual investors actually lost in trading. So, that's a huge number and that is kind of what we are going to discuss on equities look good, they give very good returns in the long term a lot of times, but there is a huge amount of risk as well. So we have a panel of experts today who, are, who actually manage your money, by the way, in all the mutual funds. So <laughs> there, there could be a lot of uh, questions around it. And uh, so they will explain the nuances of the uh, equity market and handle this tricky question on whether uh, equity MFs are really a short, short way of wealth creation. So starting with you, Anish, uh, investment in equities is rising consistently in India, like we all know. Uh, but what does this increased participation in equities mean for investors? Well, uh, it's good that equity participation is rising. Uh, to the extent that people are coming with the, with the right appetite for risk, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, although at this point, right, when I see a lot of people getting drawn in um, with very, at very high valuation levels, it does worry me. And, you know, uh, I, I would also make the point that when I look at the title of this discussion, right, equity mutual funds, a sure shot way of creating wealth, I, I almost feel, look, equity and sure shot should not be in the same sentence uh, anyway, right? So, exactly. Uh, that is, that is that's, a lot of times that people, uh, you know, kind of get into that. that yeah. That's why it's a trick question. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, like, I, I wanted to bring out some statistics which point the other way. Everybody knows the positives and uh, over time, if you stay invested, you're likely to end up better off. But let me give you some contra examples. And what happens if you enter at the wrong time in a big way at extremes, right? So, one point in time when the market was at an extreme valuation was 2008, right? So, if you entered small cap space in 2008, if you bought the small cap 100 index in January 2008, and you held on till January 2020, that's a period of 12 years. So, think about it, right? If somebody who had a child entering KG in class in 2008 put money in for his college and withdrew in 2020, what do you think would have been the small cap return uh, over a 12-year period? Well, Your guess? My guess is that usually they say that hold small caps for as long as possible. But what, you, what would you think you would have made? In general, maybe they would, uh, should have been a gain. Sorry? They should have been a gain. By, so so, you know so if you look at the small cap index from January 2008 to January 2020, the NSE 100 was flat over a 12-year period. And the NSE 50, a small cap 50, was down 30% over a 12-year period, right? So my point is like, yes, equity mutual funds are great uh, investments over the long term. But that does not mean that if you, if you come in at extremes and if you come in in, you know, what's the flavor of the month, uh, you will necessarily do well. So some amount of caution is, is always justified in... Um, in, in, in equity investment is my suggestion at this point. Absolutely. And small caps happen to be the riskiest of all 
uh, stocks in the market. Uh, but uh, in the same uh, kind of uh, taking the discussion forward, and Harsha, I'll come to you then. Uh, how many these? Uh, how many of these investors? Like we talked about, how DMAT accounts are really rising, and even the mutual funds are uh, seeing a lot of new folios. Do you really think these are sticky investors, and they are here for the long term, or do you think it's just a short term buzz? Uh, see, uh, investors will be from different categories, different uh, kind of behavior you would see across uh, time periods. Uh, and, and what we think is those who have experienced equity markets over a long period of time and who have uh, created reasonable wealth are the ones who believe in the power of equities and they would probably continue even with volatility. For example, those who have survived, let's say, COVID disruption, where markets fell sharply for a few months and then recovered, and obviously now we have made a lots, a lots of money from those lows. If anybody had invested pre-COVID and, and those who stayed during that disruption probably would continue because they know that even once in a lifetime kind of a disruption uh, has not led to erosion in their wealth, and over a period of time they have created wealth. That's one set of investors who would probably continue to think long term and who will continue to remain. Uh, the other set, I would say, is those who are on a disciplined way continuing to invest on a monthly basis through SIPs. Generally, their, uh, uh, their experience is also likely to be better than those who take uh, 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 large calls in terms of entering and exiting markets at different points of time. Since they do invest on a regular basis, the volatility is kind of taken care of through their uh, time of investments. Uh, those people also generally tend to be more long-term as compared to others. The only segment which is probably vulnerable for, for market shocks and hence probably uh, could move out of equities for some time, if at all it happens, would be those who have come in in the past three, three and a half years, for example, because markets have been a one-way market, right? Markets are never like this, but they have been like that for last three, four years. So at whichever point you have invested money, you have generally made money. So to that extent, they have not experienced negative returns. They have not experienced volatility. So to that extent, even if they encounter one such episode, whether all of them will still remain in the markets or not is something that we have to wait and see, but uh, by and large, SIP investors and those who have seen one or two crises during their investment horizon should continue to remain invested in equity is what uh, we see from the data and, and, and the behavior in the past. Okay, it certainly looks positive, uh, but uh, you know, uh, the SEBI whole time member just kind of elaborated on the risk reward, uh, risk and reward, the relationship between risk and reward. Now this, this equation becomes even more important for these younger investors and like Harsha said that a lot of new DMAT accounts are perhaps of younger investors. So Mahesh, my next question is to you and I want to ask you to explain a, a little bit about this risk reward concept, especially to our younger audience and even the seasoned ones who have just started into mutual funds. Yeah, so I think uh, that two parts. One question, the previous question in terms of, okay, investors, uh, even that uh, Mr. Anand Raman also talked about that, uh, you need to be in the market. See, the risk, we all know, especially equities, if you look at, right, the, they are volatile, right? Uh, there could be periods, okay, where they can give negative returns. But as you increase the time horizon, right, uh, in the market, right, the risk of negative return, because that's what investors are more fearful about, right, losing money, right? So, so that goes down. So, so one is on the risk reward, as you increase your time horizon, then you can look at much slightly risky asset class, right, which invariably will give a higher return over the longer term, that's how it happens. The risk return trade-off, if you look at higher the risk okay, in any particular asset class, the long-term returns there would be better than other asset class. So investors looking at investing uh, into uh, various asset class should understand the risk return trade-off which is there. Normally investors just look at the returns and there is very little disregard for risk. And as Anish mentioned, 
right? Uh, the experience, say for example, in this small cap uh, index, as he talked about, uh, without understanding the risk over the investors who had invested in 2008, for a 12 year period, they didn't earn any returns because uh, they didn't understand the uh, risk uh, what, uh, say, a small cap okay, would have vis-a-vis, -vis, say, a large cap. So, th so the way to uh, manage the risk for investors is A, uh, to increase the uh, time horizon if that's possible. Uh, the other way to do is that to diversify because each asset class, there is, I mean, uh, they are uncorrelated. There is some amount of correlation which is there, but uh, when, when equities go, goes up, okay, you would see probably debt returns could be negative because uh, interest rates go up. Okay, in a rising economy. Uh, we see that gold also as, a, as an asset class acts to diversification, especially during any geopolitical risk. Uh, it uh, tends to do better. So diversifying across asset class will enable investors to uh, increase the overall risk adjusted returns, right? Because uh, of the uncorrelated nature of various asset class. So I think that's another way to really, uh, for investors to really uh, manage the risk uh, across the portfolio. And the mutual fund platform now offers a wonderful way for investors to diversify that, right? Not only they can uh, invest into various assets, like we have funds, uh, equity funds, uh, we have debt funds, we have hybrid funds, we have uh, gold ETFs, right? We have commodity now funds, uh, we have REITs, Invits also, which are there. So you can choose a bouquet of this, or the best way would be then to come through a multi-asset fund, right? So uh, the mutual fund industry also a few years back uh, launched the multi-asset funds which are investing across asset classes and then deciding uh, the fund, fund house or the fund manager deciding in terms of which asset class, okay, where the allocation needs to be depending on the relative risk return and the uh, outlook on each asset class. So I think uh, by using these products, investors can uh, manage the risk at the same time want to create long-term wealth. Because just because you're risk averse doesn't mean that you should be in a safe asset class in a fixed deposit, right? Uh, you need to take risk because that's the only way you can earn, you can create wealth over longer term which can beat inflation and be able to meet your goals. So one should not be afraid of that, but uh, with proper diversification, with proper uh, diversification across asset classes. And also, I think, uh, the way you invest in the market. That SIP is a wonderful way where investors, the, it's about how you invest into the market because any volatile asset class, if you're able to invest into, the mark, into that asset class at various points in times, yeah, in the ups as well as the down, because timing is very difficult, right? Nobody can time the market. Uh, even in this case, right, of a small cap index, right, where point to point it would not have given return over the last 12 years, but you had invested every month, say for example, in SAP, I think your return outcome there would have been much better. So I think, again, the way you invest into a market in terms of regularly at various ups and downs, I think is also important to stay investing, continue to do that, not to stop. And you ask the question about how long investors invest uh, and continue with their investments. So if you continue with that journey with a disciplined manner, I think then the outcome would be much better, at least in line with the long-term target returns of the asset class. Investor experiences are different because they tend to time the market, they come at the wrong time, they get at the wrong time, and that's why while we all show the returns in our fact sheets, right? The fund has given so much returns, but investor expect return, actual returns are not that great because the way they enter the market and time the market really uh, changes the whole experience. Yeah, of course, the good thing about uh, the industry right now is, is that, you know, there are a lot of options, like you mentioned the multi-asset fund that has come up. Uh, so actually, uh, you know, the investors have a lot of other options to kind of look at. Another thing that has become very popular is, uh, and it's not new in India, it's not an innovation exactly, is index funds. And especially because, uh, you know, the markets are constantly rising, they're all talking about it. So, uh, uh, Nilesh, I'll ask you, uh, do you think that index funds are the simplest way of creating wealth in that sense? Because, you know, we have seen the index kind of, uh, the sensex has, is, I think, thrice what it was 10 years ago. Yeah, the question is on popularity of index funds. Index funds, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do they really answer the question of... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, See, in India, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, Indian markets have done well over a long period of time. I mean, if you start from index was launched in 1979, right? And 100 index is actually 85,000 sensex. And if you, that's not also right because if you include dividends and all, 
then the total index is north of 1 lakh or so. So we are talking about 15, 16% compounding because the GDP is growing, etc. All of us know about it. So within that, uh, obviously, as Mahesh alluded to, I mean, mutual fund obviously is among the, one of the best products for retail investors to participate for longer term, uh, to participate in the earnings and the GDP growth. And uh, uh, there is a debate between active and passive, and index funds do make a lot of sense because uh, it eliminates one, uh, one nuance while selecting a fund, which fund to buy in terms of selection of the manager because you are taking call on the country, you are talking, taking call on the GDP growth and taking call that earnings would grow and so would return over a few decade period. And uh, uh, as it is, even non-index or the active funds are, uh, 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 is a beautiful product. I mean, it's so cost competitive, it's not very expensive, it's so transparent. And that ecosystem has matured both manufacturer, channel partners. So it's an excellent product for retail investors to participate. And within that, if you don't have to select the which fund to buy, but more to look at the nomenclature and the broad buckets, then index fund makes uh, a very good sense, uh, given that it is, uh, it is further cost competitive. The cost of uh, uh, the, uh, the manager is much lower in that, uh, literally zilch. And also the fact that you don't have to worry about who is the uh, sort of fund manager. Yeah. But would you really advise only index funds or a mix of? No, it's like, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's slightly more nuanced. That's why we have channel partners and advisor. We cannot paint with the same brush, uh, everything. Because there is a, uh, while we have stock positive on the index fund, the reason is the Indian economy itself is in a excellent uh, shape. So you'll participate at least to the extent of the broader earnings. Uh, but within that, uh, active funds in India have uh, enough and more role for very longer term because in a growing economy you have a lot of uh, difference in terms of which stocks will do well within a sector etc or so. So there is a room for active selecting active funds also. As I said if the question is is it very simple and easier for an investor to have some portion into index fund yes that is better than not owning a mutual right. fund. Yeah. Right. So now coming to this whole debate of small caps which like really rallied over the last year and some of you have mentioned it also. So uh, I would like to ask you, Harsha, that uh, you know, uh, you've said earlier that uh, they are expensive despite high, higher valuation. And uh, why are really investors reposing faith in small caps? See, if you purely look at it based on uh, historical valuation range and today's valuations, small caps by and large look quite expensive. Uh, but it's not a homogeneous mix. So that's where we as active portfolio managers will have to look for opportunities which are relatively uh, safe and, and where the valuations are probably better than the rest of the market, etc. Uh, however, if you look at small cap index valuations today and uh, let's say a 15-year valuation average, definitely they are at almost 70-80% premium to that average. Now, one could make an argument that India has changed. There is a lot more opportunity for businesses to grow. Economic growth has been strong. Uh, the definitions in terms of mid and small caps have been so crystal clear that now there is a lot more money going into these segments. And, and, and probably uh, the SIPs are also seeing a tilt towards mid and small. Hence, some of this could continue and maybe the valuations that you had seen 10 years back, 15 years back, uh, is, is not really uh, a correct valuation. So even if you make that argument and look at only the recent times and the current valuations, even then probably uh, small caps are 40-45% premium to that average. So I think there is definitely risk at the index level for the small caps. Uh, if you are a very long-term investor, maybe you will be able to weather through the volatility that comes in this basket. But even then, I think it's better to have a tilt towards large caps and keep some small cap allocation in your portfolio. This is like, this is not your balanced meal if you have too much of small caps looking at only past returns, right? So if you want to have a balanced portfolio, you need to have all asset classes and based on your risk profile, you need to be allocating into those asset classes, right? If somebody had put 
X amount of money in small caps three years, four years back. Now that would have grown to much higher allocation compared to other asset classes, right? The first thing is to understand that there is high valuation there. And the second is to probably make sure that asset allocation comes back to the original intended asset allocation, right? I'm not even saying that you should sell all of the small caps. I'm just saying whatever super normal profits you have made, you probably need to move it into other asset classes or to large cap so that your asset allocation at least remains OK. Uh, if you do that, I think over the long term, equities have shown that they will deliver uh, uh, results. And hopefully, with a growing economy, we should be able to see that even going forward. Right. But recently, Nilesh, I read something from you where uh, you kind of nuanced it and said that all mid caps and small caps are not necessarily expensive. So how, uh, what would you say about that? So what I mean to say is that, you know, when different fund managers and experts kind of say different things, of course, there is a context to it. Sometimes it may become confusing for the investors. No, while I will sort of concur with everyone that uh, it's on the higher side, the valuations of uh, small and mid caps, but there are a couple of points, uh, more nuances in terms of the actual, the entire space, mid space, mid cap and small cap space has changed big time in last five years in terms of number of businesses available, the scale of businesses. You'll be surprised the cutoff of mid cap, the 100 company is more than a lakh crore market cap. Five years back, it was 30,000 crore market cap. Same is with the, the small cap definition. The scale has increased. The choices of businesses have, have increased because of unorganized to organize, because of IPOs, etc. So the definition of large cap is restricted to 100 slots, and that is not able to fulfill the, the representation of businesses. I'll give you a few very glaring examples. Let's say recently, last week only, NSC launched a capital market index. And none of the company, whether the largest AMC, Broking, RTAs, other thing, or uh, 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 stock exchange, etc., will not find in top 100. None of the companies are large cap. If you look at healthcare space, the hospital space, the choice is significantly different than what it was five, ten years back. So, if you want a proper, uh, we set aside the valuation for a moment. But if you want a proper representation of many business, all all businesses, or a play on the country, or the GDP, or the changes uh, uh, of how all the new companies happening, I think. Uh, enough and more dosage of small and mid cap should be there. So the go-to category should be more like large and mid cap or a flexi cap or a multi cap sort of thing. So because, because the choice of the businesses are much more. But yeah, that said, what has happened is, I mean, is what we are covering today, again, in last four or five years because of listings, markets, and of course, flows also, the number of the uni universe has increased significantly. So even if, let's say, 70% is expensive on a 600 stock universe, there is enough and more which is reasonable to find. And as it is, small cap is much more nuanced in terms of which stock sort of within, doing well. For example, maybe banking or consumer sector, they are not so expensive than sort of other sectors. So long answer, but I think that small and mid cap should be a core portion compared to what it was four or five years back. Of course, the way to mitigate is to look it through a very longer term lens and have a staggered investment. Yeah. yeah, but in fact, this is an important conversation because even Anish was heard saying around six to eight months back that uh, investors should be gradually booking profits in small and mid caps and move to large caps. So what was the rationale behind it? Well, I think valuations uh, even six months back were not uh, cheap, right? And uh, were expensive. Uh, see, I'll make a, a couple of points between how people think about small and, and large caps. For me, the definition of what makes a good, strong company, right? You want to uh, invest in strong businesses, whether they're small or large cap. Right? So the definition of a strong company does not change. A strong company is typically the market leader in its industry. It's typically um, got has demonstrated track record of profitability, and it has got room for growth. Now, if you are in a large industry like automobiles, then the companies that are making automobiles end up being large caps. Similar, but a company that's making only tires which go into automobiles might be a small cap or a mid cap, right? My point is what's happening right now is that some of the small cap companies which actually ultimately depend on large cap companies, right? Or some industries won't consolidate, right? I mean, you have to, do you have, you have to actually ask the question. Like there are only four uh, automakers in the country or five automakers in the country, big ones, right? 
will will every small cap sector consolidate that way will will there be only five hospital chains in the country or will there be hundreds so you have to ask these questions I'm, i'm not saying i have all the answers my sense is that in some of the small cap space this these questions are not being asked and people are jumping in and assuming that every company will become a mega huge company irrespective of the ultimate size of the industry or whether it will consolidate or not so i i do think that in small and mid cap uh, the assumptions that are being made about the future are more optimistic than uh, than they should be if i may can i just add one point on uh, on sure. the active versus passive please go ahead see <clears throat> because i also manage a large cap fund there's a huge debate you know and people think large cap should only be only be uh, passive so let me ask you a simple question right uh, my point is that if you like a stock at 100 you should like it less at 200 that you would agree right you cannot say i want to like something more at 200 than i did at 100 a passive fund does the opposite right think about how a passive fund invests at 100 it will have a smaller weight in the index at 200 it will have a larger weight in the index you will allocate more of your money after a stock has gone up maybe i am not smart enough to beat it but surely it should be possible conceptually to beat an investment strategy that is buying more when it's more expensive right that's my fundamental belief the second point i make is you know a lot of times you compare active funds and you compare it with the index but that's not a fair comparison because you have to compare it with an index fund an index fund also has transaction costs and an index fund also has distribution costs so the right comparison is an active fund with an index fund not with the index because the index is not an investable instrument and when you do that comparison active funds actually look much better than the story that's typically made hey so many only so many so few of them are beating the index but that's not relevant right that's true but that's a debate that is uh, yeah. you know <laughs> uh, evergreen i think and uh, mahesh would you like to add anything on the small cap argument or the index fund argument we have talked a lot about that small cap and mid cap but i will just say that i mean uh, in a portfolio you should have all kind of stocks okay depending on their merit right what has happened that in the last 2 3 years we talked about risk right so any risk has got rewarded disproportionately so we have seen many stocks go up okay uh, without because of liquidity because of the money flow which was there and this is a time now to be slightly much more nuanced uh, try to really drill down and be more uh, discreet in your portfolio in your stock selection that's all i'm saying there are good opportunities i think india is a growth economy right and we are in the growth phase of economy in this period we normally see that small cap and mid cap at least their earnings growth is much superior right because uh, in in a growing economy a larger cap probably they are much more stable they provide stability to the portfolio so obviously there is no doubt that over a longer term small cap and mid cap because of the economy continues to grow at the space earnings growth will be better you will make returns at this point in time some caution that's all is what what we are seeing and and try to really uh, manage the risk in that sense as far as index funds are concerned i would say that i mean it makes sense especially for investors who are coming to the uh, investing without any advisor right so if you are if you don't have a lot of investors are coming directly right uh, into the market through the platforms so as uh, nilesh also mentioned which fund to choose right uh, which fund manager to allocate money if okay, that's a decision okay which you can't do in that scenario i think uh, index investing into index fund makes sense because at least you will get market returns right so i would say if you're coming directly into the market and don't want to the hassle of trying to decide i think uh, and not coming through a uh, advisor obviously you also save on the uh, the commission side so i think then in that scenario for those investors index fund investing can make sense but otherwise i think the india market still offers a good opportunity for alpha creation uh, it's a growing economy there are a lot of new companies which are coming in a lot of ipos which you have seen in the last couple of years i mean they have been very good quality companies unlike in the past the quality of ipos has been fairly good so all these companies are there before they actually become a part of the index there is enough opportunity for active fund managers to take in the portfolios and uh, slightly generate uh, better returns on alpha okay thank you so much uh, gentlemen but before i let you go uh, this is not a karan johar show but i am doing a rapid fire round with them very brief answers and very simple questions to all of you uh, so the first one is what what's your favorite sector currently we can start with anish and go on like that insurance Ins- it services sorry it services what's the question i didn't get it 
Uh, what's your favorite sector currently? Okay, so I would say uh, consumer discretionary because okay, uh, it's long-term secular growth. I think that's the sector which we like. Yeah. Banking, I think it's reasonably Banking. priced. Okay, so um, this is a, a bit personal. So what does your personal asset allocation look like? Because we've spoken about a lot about asset allocation and diversification. So Anish. I have a little bit of real estate and like in the last, since I've been a fund manager, I've deployed all my incremental investments into my own funds. In mutual funds? In my own funds. I mean, the funds that I manage. Largely tilted towards equities. Okay. Yeah, same here. I think uh, almost 80% would be into equities and balance would be real estate and fixed income. Great. Yeah, almost everything in equities. I mean, conceptually what I do and probably also we try to communicate is that whatever is the need for next, say, three-year period or so, whatever is the need of uh, expenses, maybe big ticket expenses, we try to allocate to meet through fixed income sources or so. Remaining rest goes to equities, yeah. But a lot of uh, preference for equities, of course, these are equity fund managers and they are the ones who are managing their money. So, of course, they know all the right tricks to manage their own. And thanks a lot on that note for being part of this panel.